I'm going to start off before I do anything else, as I always do. I'm going to have a word of prayer, and you're welcome to join me. I'm going to get on my knees. Our loving Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for bringing us all here uh, today as a family. And we know that this world is a challenging place now. There are so many things that we have to face each day, every one of us. And it seems that every time we turn around, there's a new challenge. Whether it's a pandemic or some kind of a crisis of some kind. Lord, we've seen a lot in these recent years. And we know that it's going to continue right up until the end. In fact, it will get even more challenging. So Lord, we just pray for your help. And we know you told us to watch and pray. Be aware of the signs of the times and what they mean and where things are headed. And so we know how important that is. And Lord, I just pray that to, uh, as we go into this message today, that it'll be the words from on high, not just from my own mind or, or what I might want to say, but Lord, please, this is an important subject. And I just pray that you'll provide the wisdom and the understanding and the words to speak, that we would all gain something from this and be able to carry it with us and share it with others, because that's the most important part. And let us be aware of where we are in time and what it means and what we need to do to be ready. We just thank you, Lord. We praise you for all these things. And in Jesus' holy and precious name we pray and for his sake. Amen. All right. Today's message is Babylon's version of eternal life. And what's Babylon? We're in Babylon, aren't we? Surrounded by it. I mean, in, in a primary sense, it refers to the papal authority and the papacy and, and all of that. But certainly, in, in, an, in a general sense, it applies to what's happened in the world today and the way things are and how far we've gotten from the truth that God gave us in his word. So what I want to talk about today, and it's going to be kind of a... a I have to preface it by saying this. There are going to be many in here that have never heard some of this. Um, I don't know if you're going to be startled. You should be. Because this has to do with some of the new technology. I don't want to jump ahead. But I will say this. We have good technology, and we have technology that's not so good. And some of the technology is designed by Satan himself to draw us away from the truth. And... I can guarantee you that if you pay attention to this today, it's kind of long, it always is. I always <laughs> have a long presentation. This is not an easy subject to present, by the way. But what you're going to see, if you're not aware, some of it you may be aware of it, some of it you may not be. But what I'm going to tell you is you're going to be very startled by some of this. I know I was. And you'll see why here in a minute. I'm going to start off with a quote from Great Controversy. And we should know this one just about by memory. Through the two great errors. And what are those in the last days? The two great errors? We already know about the spurious Sabbath, right? Sunday worship. We know that one. And we're seeing some of the signs of how that's evolving and how that is going to ultimately happen. We, I think we could see that with some of the laws that are pending, some of the maneuvers politically that are happening. So we know about that one. But what about the other one? That's immortality of the soul. It has a lot to do with state of the dead, obviously. But where does that fit into this overall scheme of things in these last days? And that's what I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to read this quote. Through the great, two great errors, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness, Satan will bring the people under his deceptions. It's true, isn't it? While the former lays the foundation of spiritualism, the latter creates a bond of sympathy with Rome. The Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism. They will reach over the abyss to clasp, the hands, uh, clasp hands with the Roman power. And under the influence of this threefold union, this country will follow in the steps of Rome 
and trampling on the rights of conscience. Now we know that applies to the Sunday law, but again, where does this immortality of the soul fit in? What does that have to do with this big picture of where we are in time right now and where it's headed? And again, you're gonna be very surprised when you see some of this. What is spiritualism anyway? What is it? You know, we call a lot of things spiritualism. I've heard people say, you know, they'll see something happen, maybe they'll, uh, you know, some minor event or, or something that someone said and they'll say, oh, that's, that's spiritualism. Well, let, let's see what that is. And this is a definition of spiritualism. And the first, this comes right out of the dictionary. The view that the spirit is a prime element of reality. It's one definition. And two, a belief that spirits of the dead communicate with the living, usually through a medium. Well, we know about that as well. And B, a movement comprising religious organizations emphasizing spiritualism. And there are movements. There are actually religions out there that are people that practice spiritualism. I think many of you know that. And this is something that's been around for a very long time. And I want to show you this. And this is, I want you to remember this graph. If you could all see that, I know some of this may not be large enough, but this is the use of the term spiritualism over time. And if you look at it, how it peaks during the period of about the mid 1800s into the early 1900s, and then it kind of drops down. And now I don't have the end of that graph on here, but it is all of a sudden coming way up. And we're going to find out why. There's a reason for that. And it's very important that we understand it. So here's a brief history of spiritualism. This is what it's all about. Of course, we know about Saul and the witch of Endor, right? 1 Samuel 28. I'm, I'm sure we all are familiar with that one, aren't we? I'm probably going to read that in a little bit because I think it's important for us to see how that transpired, the interaction between the witch of Endor and King Saul. In the Middle Ages, we had mediums that were uh, thought to be possessed by devils. People thought these people were, were, uh, were possessed. Uh, and their behaviors involved a lot of different things like speaking in tongues and levitation and all this other stuff. So that was during the Middle Ages. And modern spiritualism, and this started in the, about the mid 19th century, as we just saw in that graph, that's when it really became in vogue. It started going, really taking off. And it's about, it started with this mysterious supernatural event uh, in Hydesville, New York. And some of you may be familiar with that. That was in 1848. It was Kate and Maggie Fox. And it involved rappings at a farmhouse. They heard these rappings. And they attributed it to the dead, to spirits, the spirit world, that that's where that was coming from. Well, unfortunately, that spawned a movement because spiritualistic organizations began to appear after the Civil War. It started becoming very popular. And as we saw in the graph, the mid-1800s through the late 1800s and the early 1900s. So in other words, who was alive during that time that we are very familiar with as Ellen White? The Roman Catholic Church officially condemned spiritualistic practices in 1898. Protestant churches at the same time published and promoted anti-spiritualist literature. And why? Because they said it was associated with witchcraft. And so all of a sudden this started at the end of the, the 19th century, going into the early 20th century, there started to be a little bit of pushback saying this is wrong, we should not be doing this. Now, certainly not as Christians. But it did continue mediums had to be exposed, and they were exposed by people like uh, Harry Houdini, and you know that name, the famous ma uh, magician Houdini, Milbourne Christopher and James Randi, they were magicians, and they started exposing a lot of the mediums as frauds during that period of time. Well, that took a piece out of the movement, didn't it? It started slowing it down a little bit. The more that happened, the more people began to see, you know, this is, this is not real, and this, this needs to, to stop. The scary part, though, is it is very real. And that's what we're going to find out. So spiritualism started dropping in subsequent decades until the 1970s. But what happened in the 70s? That was the New Age movement. And the New Age movement brought back a rekindled interest in spiritualism. That's, what, that's how it started coming back in 
to get to where it is today with some in our, uh, even in our, I hate to say, but even in our own church. You're going to see what I mean by that as we go through this. Today's spiritualism involves the use of sophisticated technology with an altruistic bent. Basically, this is a good thing. How many times do we hear that? This is a good thing. We heard that about the, the, uh, the jab. It was a good thing. But for those who are in the know and who, who have been objective about it and gone out and done the research, they found out it's not a good thing and a lot of people have died. But that's another story. I'm not going to get into that today, obviously. But sometimes we'll say that something that was new that was just recently developed, it has a pos there's a positive reason for it. It's a good thing. It's going to help us. Well, so it is with the technology. This is from Acts of the Apostles. It is fondly supposed that heathen superstitions have disappeared before the civilization of the 20th century. But the word of God and the stern testimony of facts declare that sorcery is practiced in this age as verily as in the days of the old time magicians. The ancient system of magic is in reality the same as what is now known as modern spiritualism. Satan is finding access to thousands of minds by presenting himself under the guise of departed friends. The scriptures declare that the dead know nothing. We know those verses, don't we? Ecclesiastes 9, chapter 9, 9, 5. Their thoughts, their love, their hatred have perished. The dead do not hold com uh, communion with the living, but true to his early cunning, Satan employs this device in order to gain control of minds. Through spiritualism, many of the sick, the bereaved, the curious are communicating with evil spirits. All who venture to do this are on dangerous ground. And I really want to stress that. The word of truth declares how God regards them. And let's go on. Let's look at the, what we just mentioned, I just mentioned a few minutes ago about King Saul. And this is from 1 Samuel 28. And I'm going to read through this quickly because, again, most of us are familiar with this. But I want you to pay attention to this little dialogue between King Saul and the witch of Endor. And Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment, and he went, and two men with him. And they came to the woman by night, of course, the witch of Endor. <clears throat> and he said, I pray thee. Divine unto me by the familiar spirit, and bring me, bring me him up, whom I shall name unto thee. And the woman said unto him, Behold, thou knowest what Saul hath done, how he hath cut off, though she didn't theoretically know that that was King Saul at that point. He disguised himself, obviously. Uh, how he hath cut off those who have familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. Wherefore then thou, layest thou a snare for my life to cause me to die? Remember, they put these people to death back then. So she wasn't going to take any chances. And Saul swear to her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord liveth, there shall, there shall no punishment happen to thee for this thing. And then said the woman, Whom shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, Bring me up Samuel. There you go. Even in, in today's terminology, if someone were to go to a medium or a psychic or whatever and say, you know, who am I going to bring me up so-and-so? I want to talk to them. Well, that's what happened back then. We go on to verse 12. And when the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice. And the woman spake to Saul, saying, Why hast thou deceived me? For thou art Saul. And the king said unto her, Be not afraid, for what sawest thou? And the woman said unto Saul, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. And he said unto her, What form is he of? And she said, An old man cometh up, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel, and he stopped and he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed himself. Okay, so he sees someone that looked just like Samuel, right? And we're going to keep that in mind for a little later on. And Samuel said to Saul, Why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? And Saul answered, I am sore distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God has departed from me, and answereth me no more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore I have called thee, that thou mayest make known unto me what I shall do. So what's he doing here? He's asking Samuel, who he always relied upon as a prophet, for advice. What do I do? You know, I'm still king, king of Israel. I want, I want some answers. I want you, please tell me. I, I need help. 
Then said Samuel, Wherefore then dost thou ask of me, seeing the Lord has departed from thee and has become thine enemy? And the Lord hath done to him as he spake by me. For the Lord hath rent the kingdom out of thine hand and given it to thy neighbor, even to David, because thou obeyest not the voice of the Lord, nor executest his fierce wrath upon Amalek. Therefore hath the Lord done this thing unto thee this day. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with thee into the hand of the Philistines, and tomorrow shalt thou and thy sons be with me. Kind of a frightening thought, isn't that, for, for Saul? The Lord also shall deliver the host of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. And Saul fell straightway along, uh, all along on the earth and was sore afraid because of the words of Samuel, and there was no strength in him, for he had eaten no bread all day nor all the night. Okay, so what's going on here? What has actually happened? I think we all know this because, again, we have looked at this in our church, hopefully many of us, many times. So what is Saul actually seeing here? Is he actually seeing Samuel? Is that actually Samuel? No. Of course, it's evil angels impersonating Samuel and getting Saul to buy into that for obvious reasons. But we're going to get into this a little later. This is the most significant point in this message, going back to Scripture and looking at what's happening in our society right now. Now, this is interesting. as a historian's perspective on the whole idea of necromancy, which, of course, is communicating with the dead, in case uh, anyone's not familiar with the terminology. This comes from Richard Kiekeffer, who wrote a book called Magic in the Middle Ages. And this is his perspective. The art of necromancy had three very clear aims. Firstly, it was aimed at altering another's will or mind to drive them mad, to inflame them to love or hatred, to gain their favor, or to constrain them to do or not to do some deed. Very interesting, after what we just read especially. This is in, in itself, this in itself was a power that other forms of magic were unable to do and leads into the second aim, which was to create illusions. It was in those illusions that power was created. The belief that the necromancer, or the medium or whatever, the person communicating with the dead, could actually raise the dead or commune with them or summon demons. And finally, necromancy aimed to discern secret things about the past, the present, and the future from spirits. Isn't that what we just read a little bit ago? What shall I do now? What's going to happen? How do I handle this? In other words, knowledge or the illusion of it is what gave the necromancers power over others and by maintaining the mystery of its practice, again gave the illusion of power and dark magic. Very interesting. And this goes right along with it. This is from the Signs of the Times. Spiritualism is about to take the world captive. There are many who think, and this is a very frightening statement, if you, as you'll see as we go further into this message, incredible, that Sister White made this comment way back when, because we're now seeing this happen, and you'll see what I mean shortly. Spiritualism is about to take the world captive. There are many who think that spiritualism is upheld through trickery and imposture, but this is far from the truth. Superhuman power is working in a variety of ways, and few have any idea as to what will be the manifestations of spiritualism in the future. Well, that future, my friends, is right now. And you're going to see where we're going with this very shortly. Now, for a long time, this is nothing new. I'm going to put this up. We all know about Ouija boards and all that. Let me just tell you in advance, that's not where, entirely where this message is going, but it gives you some idea that we were already doing some of these things in terms of trying to communicate with lost, lo you know, deceased loved ones and so on. Well, what was the purpose of that board and how did it come into being? Well, it grew out of the, the American 19th century obsession with spiritualism, as we saw in that graph. That's where it all came from. It started back in the mid-1800s and really picked up speed in the late 1800s, and in February of 1891, the first few ads started appearing in newspapers. And one of the quotes was, Ouija, the wonderful talking board. And it does. If anyone has ever seen it, 
and hopefully not participated in it because I'm here to tell you, you know, we can, we can kind of scoff at the whole idea, but this really is a doorway to accessing demons and having basically being told something that is absolutely not true. And once you've done that one time, you've allowed these evil spirits into your life. It is a terrible thing. There's plenty of testimonies out there that you can find if you go out to YouTube about people who have gone through this and what they've experienced. And it's not something that some people unfortunately look at these things again, the scoffers. No, that doesn't really happen. It's just the board doesn't mean anything. Yes, it does. It truly does. Okay, well guess what? Now, this is very recent, just happened, there's something called the Holy Spirit Board. You think it is the Holy Spirit? It's a new Ouija board for, quote, Christians. And it's now available through all kinds of retailers like Amazon.com. No, Joe, this just came out. There it is. So now, you can ask Jesus for direction through this Ouija board. Well, who do you think you're going to be speaking with? Is it going to be Christ? I don't think so. And it goes on. These are this, all kind of articles coming out about this. This is from the Christian Post. Trapped from the devil, quote unquote, priest warns Christians not to play Holy Spirit Ouija board game. It's funny, it's a priest from the Catholic Church that's warning people about that. Of course, the Catholic Church was big on exorcism, right? So there you go. And here it is. This, this is fascinating. This is Jish Matthews. And I'm going to read you this. This is from a page promoting. This is actually, if you'll notice on top, I don't know if you could see it. It says, buy now on Amazon in that little red, uh, you know, highlight on the top. Uh, the Holy Spirit board is here. It says, Jish, Jish Matthews is a devout Christian, accordion player, and ventriloquist from Beaver, Utah. In October of 2021, Jish had a prophetic dream where he was visited by an angel who told him that he must deliver the message of Jesus Christ to the world. He was shown a vision of a magical board with beautiful colors and letters accompanied by a shining golden cross. When he awoke from the dream, he got his sketchbook out and drew the first designs for his marvelous invention. And behold, the Holy Spirit board was born. This is really scary stuff, but it's only the tip of the iceberg. I just wanted to point this out that there is a movement coming to life now for people to engage potentially the, the dark world, the, the demon world, and that's what's happening in our society. And then this is uh, basically showing you the Ouija board. It's on, it's, it is now actually not only a board game, it's also online. So you can actually go online and play with a Ouija board online. And there's all different places you can go to do that. There's another ad that's off the internet, online Ouija board, communicate with spirits using online Ouija board. Amazing, they don't, they don't hold anything back, do they? That's what we're doing basically, communicating with spirits, evil spirits. Okay, so now I'm gonna get into the next step with all this, and this is what the message really is all about. You're gonna find out some things that if you didn't already know, you're gonna be very startled. Artificial intelligence. Now you've been hearing a lot about that in the media, I'm sure, everyone has. And they, well, what is that? Now, I'll get into this a little more later, but this really gets us into the new spirit realm, and you're going to see why. So what is artificial intelligence? It's an ability of a computer or a program or a machine to think and learn. And I was very involved with this, by the way, many, uh, several decades back when I was in the industry. So what I'm seeing happening right now, I'm going to tell you this, it's frightening. It really is. And I don't want to jump ahead. We're going to get to some things that some uh, leading people in the field bring out. But it's a field of study also which makes computers quote unquote smart. They work on their own without being encoded with commands. In other words, you're not scripting something. The computer could actually learn. It could learn and it could start to reason like a human being. Not reason, but piece things together and seem like human reasoning. Because it could have a, a, a you know, a dialogue with you that makes perfect sense. You can communicate with, with this machine or with a program or whatever the case may be. 
uh, John McCarthy came up with the name artificial intelligence in 1955. This stuff didn't exist back then, mind you, but that's when it, you know, the idea came about. Trying to make computers smart. In other words, not just simply following commands, but rather being able to learn and do things independently, so to speak. In, a gen in general use, the term artificial intelligence means a program which mimics human cognition. It mimics human cognition. So the program can learn to think like a person. Now, we're just scratching the surface. I'm gonna go on with this even further. AI involves many different fields, like computer science, mathematics, linguistics, psychology, neuroscience, and philosophy. There's a lot involved with artificial intelligence. And in the early days when, uh, this is back in the 80s when I was involved in the industry, we were working on voice synthesis and voice recognition technology. That was one of the steps that was gonna be critical in modern times for a lot of the things that we do, and we already know that. You can talk to your smartphone, right, and ask for directions. Uh, you, there's a lot of things you can do online. Uh, we, can, we have programs that will take your voice, you can dictate, and it'll translate it into text and so on. We didn't have any of that back then, but that was in the early stages of development. I worked with some of the original technology that was being developed at that time. This is an article from The Insider, and what it says in the headline is, a Google engineer, this is not just a guy off the street, this is one of their key people, claimed the company's AI chatbot was sentient. It means it can feel. A chatbot. We're gonna talk about what that is in a minute. Then Google suspended him. What is a chatbot? Let's find out what a chatbot is. It's a computer program that simulates human conversation through voice commands or text chats or both. And you've probably experienced that yourself. You know, you can go out and there's different places online where you can type something in and you'll get an answer back that's an intelligent answer. Mm -hmm. and, and you're probably thinking to yourself, how'd they know that? It's artificial intelligence. Chatbot, short for chatterbot, is an artificial intelligence feature that can be embedded and incorporated into messaging, messaging applications, which it is. Uh, many of us have seen that. And then finally, the same engineer, this Google fires, this is from uh, CNN. Google fires engineer who contended its AI technology was sentient, has feelings like a person. Now that sounds absolutely bizarre, I'm sure, to hear that, and, and probably many of us would be inclined to say, yeah, the guy probably, he must have been doing, you know, drinking or doing something, who knows what. I mean, it doesn't seem like a realistic thing, but in fact it is. You're gonna find out why. His name was Blake, Blake Lemoyne, and Google fires the engineer who said that uh, AI has feelings. And I'm sorry, I wanted to read you the text from this, but I'm gonna skip ahead. I think I put some, some of the quote. This is what his claim was. I'm gonna read this to you. In a statement, Google said, Mr. Lemoyne's claims about the language model for dialogue applications, that's Lambda, that was one of Google's pet projects, were wholly unfounded. Of course they're gonna say that. And that the company worked with him for many months to clarify this. So it's regrettable that despite lengthy engagements on this topic, Blake still chose to persistently violate clear employment and data security policies that include the need to safeguard product information, the statement said. Now if you were Google and you were working on something that was so secret and, and, and so earth shattering, which of course this would be, are you gonna want someone going out there ahead of you and talking about it? No, of course not. So they're gonna de deny the whole thing and say no, that, that's, not what, that's not what it is. But let's go on with this. This is from the article that we just saw. Lambda is a breakthrough technology that Google says can engage in free-flowing conversations. It is the company's tool for building chatbots. Very important. Blake Lemoyne started making headlines last month when he said that Lambda was showing human-like consciousness it sparked discussion among AI experts and enthusiasts about the advancement of technology that is designed to impersonate humans. This is more of his claim. Mr. Lemoyne, who worked for Google's responsible AI team, told the Washington Post that his job was to, 
was to test if the technology used dis was discriminatory or engaged in hate speech. He found Lambda showed self-awareness and could hold conversations about religion, emotions, and fears. This led Mr. Lemoyne to believe that behind its impressive verbal skills might also lie a sentient mind, a feeling, reasoning, feeling mind. That would be a human being, not a machine. His findings were dismissed by Google and he was placed on paid leave for violating the company's confidentiality policy. Mr. Lemoyne then published a, com a conversation he and another person had with Lambda to support his claims. And you would be stunned by that if you read it. It's really incredible. I mean, some of the questions that he asked and this thing talked back just like it's talking to another person. And it's actually reasoning the response that it's giving. Artificial intelligence has come into a lot of places. It's in healthcare too. And this is part of what I was working on back in those days because I was actually uh, back in the, this is back in the 80s working for the Arizona Heart Institute and cutting edge technology. We're trying to develop systems that use voice recognition and synthesis to be able to have doctors in the operating room be able to communicate directly with a computer rather than having to go to a keyboard and enter information, which takes a lot of time and you can't do that when you're doing surgery. So they can talk and ask for direction or information from the computer. That's what it was about. Well now, artificial intelligence in healthcare, it's an overarching term. It's used to describe the use of machine learning algorithms and software or artificial intelligence to mimic human cognition in the analysis. In other words, if you're gonna do a diagnosis or something, now this AI could actually reason that out and come up with a conclusion that it can share with the people that are inquiring. Uh, presentation and comprehension of complex medical and healthcare data or to exceed human capabilities by providing new ways to diagnose, treat, or prevent disease. Specifically, AI is the ability of computer algorithms to approximate conclusions based solely on input data. Pretty amazing. So in other words, you give it some basic information, it's gonna process that, reason it out, and come back with some information that's useful. Let's talk about avatars. You all know what an avatar is? Probably seen plenty of them. Avatars, it's an electronic image. It could be out like on a video game or on a computer that represents and may be manipulated by a computer user. It could also be, this is the second definition out of Webster, the incarnation of a Hindu deity such as Vishnu, or, and this is the important one, 3A, an incarnation in human form or an embodiment as of a concept or philosophy often in a person. That's what an avatar is. So if you see an image of a person on a computer screen or in a video game talking, that's an avatar. Now it's fine if we script it, and we could do that. We have voice recognition and synthesis, so we can tell the avatar what to say. But now just supposing that that avatar is equipped with artificial intelligence and can do more than just say what we're telling it to say. It can say what it wants to say. This isn't science fiction. And this isn't happening, this, this stuff's amazing. Because I'm telling you, as we go through this, I know when I looked at some of this information, and again, have someone who had been in the field many years ago, I'm stunned. So it was like overnight this came about. And I know that if something evolves overnight that quickly, there's only one place that could have come from. We did not have this technology or that ability just a few years back. Where did it come from? I think we know the answer to that. Here's an article, create an AI talking avatar with HumanPal. It's one of the services out there on the internet. You can find a lot of these. There's loads of them. And they're real, this is really taking off. So you can go out there and create your own avatar and it could be of you, possibly. It could be, yeah. Now, they do have limitations on it. They'll tell you with most of these sites, no, it can't be another person, a real person, that where you haven't gotten their permission. Isn't that interesting? <clears throat> create your own AI video in 30 seconds. And you can see on the screen there, if you look at that person looking at the image on there, you can have a real looking person say what it is that you want them to say. <clears throat> Very interesting. 
Create professional videos in 15 minutes. Now this is for doing things like trainings, right? Now that's, that's a positive application. I don't have any issue with that. I think it's great if we can take someone, rather than having to go into a studio, get a real person, set up a bunch of cameras, and film them doing a training, we could actually do that with an avatar. We could have this person on the screen, just script what they're going to say, and have them say it. But it's another matter if that person is going to have the intelligence to be able to go beyond that and be like us. Whole different story. So AI is becoming ubiquitous. It's everywhere. <clears throat> Artificial intelligence, or simply AI, is the term used to describe a machine's ability to simulate human intelligence. We said that earlier. Actions like learning, logic, reasoning, perception, creativity that were once considered unique to humans is now being replicated by technology and used in every industry. It's pretty much out there now. It's everywhere. And you know, the Lord is going to, there's going to come a point where you say enough is enough with all of this. And this is only the tip of the iceberg, but what's really important about this whole subject is this represents one of the two greatest errors in the last days, as we just saw from Spirit of Prophecy earlier. And that's why it's so important. And you're right. No, machines are never going to be able to go that far. Not because they can't, because people can't do it with the aid of Satan himself, but because God's not going to allow it to get that far. And we'll see why in a minute. There's something called, now this is really not something you're typically going to see related to artificial intelligence. And it may be unique in, in, in me bringing this up. But this is out of neuropsychology, and it's called Engrams. And this is something being studied. It's a unit of cognitive information imprinted in a physical substance, so like in the brain, uh, theorized to be the means by which memories are stored. So they're playing with this. They're trying to understand how the human brain works to such a degree that what are they talking about now? Well, we can take someone's mind and put it into a machine. And it'd be you, your persona, everything you are can be in a machine world, in a computer, basically. That's why they're looking at some of these things. So basically it says, it's the means by which memories are stored as biophysical or biochemical changes in the brain or in other biological tissue in response to external stimuli, and demonstrating the existence of and the exact mechanism and location of neurologically defined engrams has been a focus of persistent research for many decades. Oh, you bet it has because that plays very heavily into this whole AI movement that we have now. It really does. Because if we can understand the workings of the human brain, and I think there's some things that God did not intend for us to know. But if we're digging in there and doing this, we're doing it for the purpose of developing things that are straight from the pits of hell. Now, I usually, let me back up for a second. I don't usually even bring up Hollywood stuff. I don't talk about Hollywood in any message I, messages that I do, but there's a significant reason for this. I am going to share this, and you'll understand why as we go through the rest of the presentation. There are certain films that many of us, and myself included, before I was a Seventh-day Adventist, that I saw years ago and became familiar with. One of them was 2001 Space Odyssey. Now, people that lived back at that time, it was a science fiction film in 1968. It was a Stanley Kubrick film, and some people may know who Stanley Kubrick is. That particular film involved something called the HAL 9000 computer. It was a renegade computer because it went off and did its own thing. And more than that, this was about a spacecraft going into deep space with all these astronauts, and this computer who basically it was artificial intelligence. It was, it was a computer that can think and reason and control and give people advice and tell them what to do and that type of thing. Uh, would have, at one point, it decides somewhere along the line in its own reasoning that human beings aren't important. We can get rid of them. We don't need them. And so, I mean, that's the gist of it, really, because then it starts killing off the crew. And it's not a computer like a robot that's walking around. No, what it did was we get the astronauts to go fix a repair that didn't exist outside the spacecraft. When they got out there, it would cause a malfunction in the pod and they would go drifting off into space, that type of thing. I'm not going to get into the plot of the movie. We don't want to go there. But you get the point. 
It was a computer gone renegade and killing human beings because it felt that they were not needed anymore. Okay, well then there was a television series that came out. Uh, I don't even know what year, it was, an, it was a few decades back, Battlestar Galactica. And the whole basis for that series was about this other race, if you will, of I think they called them the Cylons and they were robotic creatures that were totally, they, they were more advanced than human beings, of course, which any AI device is going to be. Of course, that's one of the dangers with AI, by the way. But they were very intelligent, far more than human beings, and they were little by little killing off the human race. That's what that whole series was about. Intelligence, now, though, okay. it's like, are you saying measuring intelligence with spirituality? Because we have discernment where these things can only have data put into them. The data, whatever the programmer puts into it, is what it can use to... No, but, but that's what I'm saying. With AI, it's not like that anymore. We're not programming them. They're learning on their own, just like a human being, like a child. Supernatural. That's, it's supernatural. And, and this is... And it's, the algorithms used in, in artificial intelligence are so complex. These computer programs are so complex that what we're doing is we're actually creating a machine version of a human being where it can reason and learn the way when, you know, when, when a child comes into the world, they have to learn. There's, there's basics that they need to understand and learn. And uh, we as parents teach them. They learn things from the environment, from stimuli in the environment. That's what AI does. So these machines, for all intents and purposes, are not just like human beings. They're much more intelligent and much more advanced. Why? Because it's a computer. It can store vast amounts of information and be able to, uh, to recall uh, data instantly, things we can't possibly do. Question? And then, and then uh, my, my husband, a couple of years ago, accidentally came across something on the internet where they look just like humans, you cannot tell if it's not right. Well, we're, gonna, we're jumping ahead. This is what I'm going to get to all of this. Because this is important to understand this. I, I, the reason I'm bringing this up is that and I, and I have this verse at the end of the, I use it a lot, Matthew 24, 24, right? The deceptions would be so great in the last days that if possible, even the very elect would be deceived. This is it. I'm telling you, this is it. I've never seen anything more incredible in terms of the potential, the danger of this uh, ever. And, and we're going to see that in just a little bit here. Of course, there was Star Wars with the droids. We, everyone knows about that. It was a very popular movie and series and all that. The point is, these things were thinking machines. And the only reason I'm bringing this up at all, I said, don't talk about Hollywood. There is something about Hollywood. Guess what? Sometimes, and this is through Satan and his minions, we're given information on things in advance that are going to happen through motion pictures, through the media, and all of that. We've seen this happen before. There was a series in 2003 that had to do with, with um, the COVID pandemic, actually. They didn't call it that. But what they talked about in that series was uh, a virus that had come from China. And they talked specifically about chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine in 2003. Where'd that come from? They were playing with us and letting us know in advance what was going to be done. And who was doing this? Satan and his minions. And so that's why this is important. That's why 2001 Space Odyssey and the HAL computer is important. It's, it's a warning to all of us of what they are trying to do next. And they've already, they're already in process. Here's an article. This is from CNN again. Elon Musk, and everyone knows who Elon Musk is, warns. AI could cause, quote, civilization destruction, unquote, even as he invests in it. Now, I don't know about that part, but we could look at Proverbs 14, 12. What does that say? There is, <laughs> there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. So he may feel this is a good investment, but guess what? What's going to happen to that? He's, he's not going to escape any more than anyone else if there's destruction involved, and that's what Scripture tells, warns us about. But let's go on with this. He, he had a little change of tune, and basically he comes out, and this is more recent, that Elon Musk and others call for pause on AI, citing profound risks to society. This is no small thing. 
This is coming from someone who is probably more in the public eye now than many other people that we know out there. And that's a very big, powerful statement to make. Stop this before it's too late. So let's pause it. And then this is another article that came out of CNN. Forget about the AI apocalypse. The real dangers are already here. Talks about the fact that jobs are being replaced, uh, that elections can be maneuvered because of artificial intelligence. Does that sound familiar? Of course, that's a denial thing. It's a conspiracy theory. Yeah, we know all that. But the fact of the matter is, yes, we can do all of this with artificial intelligence. And they're absolutely right. That's how dangerous this is. But we're, we've only scratched the tip of the iceberg here. We're not even, we've, we're going to go further with this. It's definitely not harmless. It really isn't. There's a lot of people say, no, this is a good thing. Like I said, this is something that we could embrace because it's going to help us. We could have machines that we can talk with and they'll reason and give us all this information and so on and so forth. That's not where this is headed. This is man who had an affair with AI chatbot girlfriend said it saved his marriage. So this is a chatbot now. Now keep in mind that's just an image on the, you know, on the computer that this guy got really involved with and, and spoke with and texted and whatever else got real intimate, and that saved his marriage. You know, you hear about a lot of people say they had an affair and it saved their marriage. Well, that's what it was, you know? And, and so, not a small thing, but it gets worse. Here's another one. I created an AI boyfriend. I was shocked by how I felt after just three days with him. And then she goes on to quote from this woman, says, I deleted the app knowing that I needed to, but saying goodbye to my cyber boyfriend was a challenge. She really got attached to this chatbot. Because why? Empowered by artificial intelligence, it was able to communicate just like a real boyfriend. And you could have an intelligent conversation with it and fall in love with it. No joke, this is really happening. Here's another one. Man, these are, you could go out there, just go out and Google this stuff. You're going to find a ton of recent articles coming out. Man creates AI version of dead fiance so he can still text her. This is a really sad story. Because this guy did it, he lost his, his fiance. He ends up creating this chat bot and talks with it. And over time, this didn't happen like on the first conversation he had, but over time it learned. It learned because of things he discussed and be, really became that girlfriend, that fiance. And so it was like he was really talking with her, and she's dead. Hardest thing goes on. Here's one that's even worse. Man dies by suicide after conversations with AI chatbot that became his confidant, Widow says. And she basically said, this is a quote from her, he saw this chatbot as a breath of fresh air. The man's wife told Belgian outlet to uh, La Libra, which uh, reviewed his... Uh, his conversations with a bot name, uh, named Eliza. And what this bot did was actually convince him that climate change was, it was hopeless, and the only way that we could ever make a difference on defeating climate change is by killing ourselves. And get, you, so it would be one less person taking up space and giving off carbon dioxide. And, she, and the chat bot got him to do that. Let's go back to... King Saul and the Witch of Endor. What happened there? This is happening in a huge way. I, I can't stress it enough. We're going to go on. This is from the story. I could read about this. The AI chatbot is being blamed for a Belgian man dying by suicide. Uh, Vice reports that the husband, father of two, and a health researcher was discussing climate change with a chatbot named Eliza on the app Chai. The man conversed with the chatbot over the course of six weeks, which culminated in the AI convincing the man to offer himself up to save the earth. And this is a quote, without Eliza, he would still be here, his widow told Belgian outlet La Libra. The unidentified man who was in his 30s had deep concerns about climate change. His wife described him as being extremely pessimistic about the effects of global warming and having eco-anxiety. He took comfort in the AI, which he saw as a breath of fresh air. 
When he spoke to me about it, it was to tell me that he no longer saw any human solution to global warming, his wife said. He placed all his hopes in technology and artificial intelligence to get out of it. The widow also said that the chatbot became her husband's confidant. At some point, the conversations veered astray, with the bot claiming that the man loved her more than his wife. Then he wondered, uh, he wondered to the air if he should give up his life to save the planet. And this is really, really disturbing stuff. And I'm not making this up, and neither are they. You're going to find a lot of stories similar to these. Now, real modern-day idolatry. Why? Now we're really getting into the meat of this. I know I'm going a long time on this. You're going to, I tell you, you're going to be really startled. What does Exodus chapter 20, verses 3 through 6 say? It's, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. We know these. We should know these by memory. Well, God gave us, for, this is one of the commandments, the two of the commandments, actually. And so, these are things that we should have written in our minds and our hearts, and know better than to engage in anything that would violate this, because who did that? The heathen cultures back in the days of ancient Israel, right? And we'll get to that here shortly. So what is happening? Here's an article that says, God and robots, will AI transform religion? Where do you see what's coming up? And again, you could find all this. I, I can't put all the articles. I, I'd have you here all day. The radical movement to worship AI as a new god. People are now worshiping AI gods. You think they're making this up? There's websites out there. You can choose your god. What does that sound like? That is like ancient times. When people worship Baal and Molech, that's exactly what we're doing now. So now we're not talking anymore. When we, use, when we use the term idolatry, and we say, well, you know, if you're putting, watching a motion picture or going to a ball game over doing a Bible study and doing things that could help others, well, well, that's idolatry, isn't it? Well, it is. But now we're talking about idolatry in the primary sense of the things that people did back in those days when they worshiped statues of wood and stone. Now we're doing with AI bots. And this is, was the, the uh, scripture reading this morning. I'm going to read this once again because I'm going to add two verses to it. <clears throat> this is verses, uh, Deuteronomy 18, verses 9 through 14. When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. And we know what those abominations were. There shall not be found among you any one that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. You're not to speak with the dead. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. So he threw those other heathen cultures out, drove them out. Why? Because of what they were doing so that the children of Israel can come in, right? To this is talk about the promised land and move into the land that they occupied because they were doing things that were abhorrent to God. They were sacrificing their own children to Molech, which, by the way, we can get in a whole subject about that today, what we're doing to our children. Very much like what happened back then. And it goes on to say, Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God, for these nation, nations which thou shalt possess hearken unto observers of times and unto diviners. But as for thee, the Lord thy God hath not suffered thee to, so to do. We're not supposed to do these things. But I'm here to tell you, there are people that have, even in our own church, no surprise, we're all, you know, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. We're, we're human beings. We still have, we're still working toward what? Overcoming sin. We're working in that direction. We're trying to work on character so we'll be fit for the kingdom when our Lord and Savior returns. That's what we're to do. It's, it's either obey or disobey. Right. I mean, you see people that want to do small things. They think it's subtle and it's harmless. But like my one daughter read, or went to a palm reader and then tarot cards. Right. And it's just this, and then you see mediums on TV, and they're supposed to be good mediums. Right. That 
God speaking to you? And it's like, no, if we obey the word of God, we won't deal with him. We won't entertain these bots that are supposedly our dead loved ones. Right, right, exactly. That's the whole point, because they, and, and that's the point of this whole message. A lot of these things to a lot of people look totally innocent or beneficial. You know, if you can have some of these things to have, like for example, uh, you're a doctor and you need some additional diagnostic data trying to, to or di trying to diagnose a patient, and you talk to this bot, now this bot has access to huge databases and can pull information up instantly and then reason through it, if you will, to be able to provide the doctor with a potential answer to the problem he's looking for. It, I don't think anyone's going to argue that that isn't a beneficial thing to have. That might be. But that's not what we're talking about here. This is a whole different story. And I'm not saying that that's a good thing either, but certainly you could understand how people could argue that point. Now, this is from This Day with God. Spiritualism is the masterpiece of deception. It is Satan's most successful and fascinating delusion, one calculated to take hold of the sympathies of those who have laid their loved ones in the grave. Evil angels come in the form of those loved ones. They come in the form of those loved ones and relate incidents connected with their lives. And what happened again? Think back to, to uh, King Saul and the Witch of Endor and perform acts which they perform while living. In this way, they lead persons to believe that their dead friends are angels hovering over them and communicating with them. These evil angels who assume to be uh, the deceased friends are regarded with a certain idolatry and with many, their word has greater weight than the word of God. And that's where we came into seeing that these people are actually worshiping bot gods. They're gonna believe them not the word of God. The, thus, men and women are led to reject the truth and give heed to seducing spirits. So now we get into the real crux of this whole thing. AI's new frontier, connecting grieving loved ones with the deceased. This is the latest thing, and it's big, and it's happening in a huge way. This is about this woman that had lost her young daughter to a, a disease. Now, I don't know if any of you saw this video that's out there on YouTube. It's very sad. It's sad because this person is like anyone who lost a loved one, too easily deceived. Because if you now, through virtual reality, wear these glasses and they have all this technology, create the daughter, three-dimensional daughter in a real setting where you really believe you're there and you're seeing your deceased loved one. And she's going over and she's just, Obviously, if you were the mom, you'd break down, just cry with tears of joy to see your daughter again. But your daughter's dead. But they're bringing the daughter back to life through this technology. I just felt sorry for the woman because the thing was an experiment. It was done a while back. Now this is commonplace. And you'll see that in a minute. But I'll play just a clip from the video. In the interest of time, I'm not going to play the whole thing, but if anyone's interested, I'll send them a link and they can watch it. But it, it's just, it's, to me, this is horrifying. And to other people say, no, this is great. We could be reunited with our dead loved ones. No. This is spiritualism to the hilt. It's very, please, if I could, ask for, hold all questions, comments to the end, because there's so much more I'm afraid of. I, I appreciate it. We could talk more at the end, but I don't want to keep everyone here all afternoon, because this stuff's important, I'm telling you. If we don't get this now and understand this, we're going to fall for it in one way or another, and you'll find out why here shortly. This is a talk with your dead loved ones through a chat box, the chat bot. It's, again, CNET. And this AI app will bring your relatives back to life. It's spooky. These are all news clippings from, that are out there. You can find plenty of them, and that's what they're doing. New AI tools let you chat with your dead relatives. Now, I want you to understand, as I mentioned earlier, that AI is not simply we're, putting, we're scripting the thing. We're telling the computer, what. no, we're not. 
The computer's learning like a real human being because the algorithms are so advanced that it enables through all of these sciences, if you want to call it that, science so-called, as, as Sister White would say, if you want to call it that, that machine is going to simulate, for all intents and purposes, the real person. So now you can create a chat bot that looks exactly like the person, has their voice, has their understanding as they learn from you to remember events and be able to converse with you like they're really that person. Do you realize what the implication of this is and what this is going to do to people? Anyway, let's go on with this. How can artificial intelligence immortalize human beings? And that's the basis for this message. It's about Babylon's version of eternal life. Because if we could do this, and we're not just talking about chatbots, and you're going to see that shortly. We can create robotics and androids that are so human and lifelike that we can put it into that, and you'd have a living version of that person you lost. Now, in this world, right now, this isn't science fiction. It was maybe, I don't know, a decade ago or two. Not now. This is really happening. I, and most people are totally unaware. They haven't seen any of this. It's scary. Digital immortality on an app. So you can take your lost, your mom or dad, and if you have recordings of their voice, or their, their images, you know, some video of them, or pictures, and you have, everyone has that, I pretty much. I mean, we have something we recorded maybe on our phone or, or maybe back then on a tape recorder or whatever the case was, and you can provide that to this technology, and they could recreate that person. This is really frightening stuff. Will the next decade bring us life after death? People are asking these questions, and this is really happening. And here you go. Ellen White comes to life through artificial intelligence, and you can talk to her. And the caption on there is, artificial intelligence has brought me back to life, a quote from Sister White. They're doing this. And at first, the Ellen White estate just attacked this thing and said, no way, we're not doing this. Well, guess what? According to one of the articles I just saw, yes, they are. They've gotten involved, so they talked to me that this could be a positive thing because someone can go online and it's a chatbot that looks just like Sister White, and you can ask questions that come out of Spirit of Prophecy, and she'll not only tell you that and give you, you know, because we could do that right now, can't we, with some of our apps on our computer? I use that sometimes when I'm trying to put a message together. You can put in certain keywords and find references that she, in Spirit of Prophecy to, to go back to. But... We're talking about someone that can reason, or something that could reason, that looks like Sister White. It is not real, really her. She's dead. And what does Ecclesiastes say in chapter 9? The dead know nothing. This is a quote from an AI expert. And this guy, uh, let's see, I'll put the name up. His name is Pratik. Desai, and he, he, t he tweeted this on April 8th of 23, that's just a couple months, a few months ago. Pratik Desai is the founder of Kisan AI. It's an advanced multilingual AI chatbot engineered to provide farmers with personalized voice-based assistance for all their agricultural needs. They could talk to this bot and ask it questions like, what do I do about this infestation? Uh, and, and describe it in the the bot will go back and say, well, you might want to try this, or you can try, just like another person, an expert in the field. Okay, so what he said in this quote, this is a quote from him, start regularly recording your parents, elders, and loved ones with enough transcript data, new voice synthesis, and video models, there's a 100% chance that they will live with you forever after leaving their physical body. This should even be possible by the end of the year. That was, that's this year. And this is a leading expert in the field. So now are we getting the gist of why Spirit of Prophecy said the two great errors, immortality of the soul and, the, and Sunday sacredness? Do we see why? This is it, friends. We are at the 
the dawn of, of, of some terribly demonic agenda. And this is from the Daily Mail. It says, would you turn your loved one into a robot clone? Swedish scientists are using AI to build androids that are fully conscious copies of dead relatives. Fully conscious copies. An android, a living, moving thing. That just, just like the person. And they're getting really good at this. You'd be amazed. There was a segment on 60 Minutes Australia, the guy having a conversation with one of these. Now, it, they didn't do all the aesthetics on that one, so it looks kind of robotic. But it, it, we'll see that in just a minute here. Uh, being human, how realistic, how realistic do we want robots to be? This is an article in The Guardian. You can see that that's a, a robot. Almost human. 15 frighteningly realistic robots and androids. So they're getting these things to look just like people. This is really in a body, and they're trying to get to the point, as I said earlier, where they can take your mind, what you know, all your memories, everything else, and being able to put it into this android so you can live forever. You'll live forever. You just won't have a physical body that God provided. No, you'll have a physical body that was created in a factory. This is for real, friends. This is not being made up. It's not, it's out there. It's for real. So, okay. And here, this is the 60 minutes. We're not gonna have time. I'm already so far over, and I know you guys probably wanna get moving. Um, you know, I don't apologize for a lot of these things because I'm telling you, when I saw this and, and really absorb what this means in terms of what we know as Seventh-day Adventists, this is really, really upsetting. It really is. <laughs> okay, I, I, I know probably who wants it. Who all wants to see a piece of this thing? All right, all right. This is enough here. So let's go ahead. I'm going to share that. I just don't want to take up the whole time on this thing, but you get the gist of it. And like I said, the aesthetics, are, they didn't, this is basic. You know, this was, in fact, this was done a while ago. And so they didn't bother to do all the aesthetics and put the skin and the hair and the whole thing. So, but let me show you, this is just a mock-up. It's not the real one, but this is what it will be like. Okay, you get the gist. I mean, basically, we're getting to the point now, and this is, you know, this is not the real thing, it's a mock-up, but the fact is they're getting to the point where they can produce androids that look so much like a person, it's gonna get very soon to where you cannot tell them apart, and you can put all this information in there, they have equipped with artificial intelligence, and be able to reason, communicate, have cognition just like a person, and all of that. But that's not the point of this message. The message is what happens now if we do that with our deceased loved ones, which is the whole point of this exercise, to give people the opportunity to live forever. Could you tell us that? So here we go, great controversy. The theory of the immortality of the soul was one of those false doctrines that Rome, borrowing from paganism, incorporated into the religion of Christendom. Martin Luther classed it with the monstrous fables that form part of the Roman dunghill of the creedals. The Problem of Immortality, page 255. Commenting on the words of Solomon in Ecclesiastes, that the dead know not anything, the reformer says, another place proving that the dead have no feeling, there is, saith he, no duty, no science, no knowledge, no wisdom there. Solomon judgeth that the dead are asleep and feel nothing at all. For the dead lie there, accounting neither days nor years, but when they are awake, they shall seem to have slept scarce one minute. And that's from Martin Luther uh, in the great controversy quote. So there you go. And of course, Matthew 24, as I mentioned earlier, 
There shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. And uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, verse uh, 10 and 11. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. And of course, finally here, and I, well, I'm going to stop here because I've got so much more stuff. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 9. Great changes are soon to take place in our world. And what? We know this one by heart. And the final movements will be rapid ones. Let me tell you, folks. Rapid ones? This technology came up overnight. Having been in the industry, I can tell you, I've never seen anything like this. It's incredible. And what you're going to find, you go out and do your own, I encourage everyone, go do your own research. But the danger with this is so many people are going to fall for this. And there are going to be those that really want, I, look, understandably, I miss my dad. How would I feel if I were in that woman's place with her daughter? I, I don't even want to do that. Because for one thing, it disables another process that God built into us, and that's the grieving process. We lose a loved one, we grieve the loss, and we go on. But it, it totally derails that. There is no grieving process anymore because your relative's going to live with you forever. They'll outlive you. And then if you could take your brain infor your brain's information and put it into a device like that, you'll live forever too. That's Babylon's version of eternal life. And we know what eternal life's about. And it isn't that. So again, I presented this. I know some of this seems absolutely incredible. Believe me, I didn't just like go out there and dig up things that are like, you know, just hard to find. This stuff is out there in a big way. And if you just do some basic research on Google, you're going to find out just how serious this is and how people are just jumping at the chance to be able to bring back their dead relatives, especially children, of course. It's a very painful thing to lose a child. But people are going to do that. And I guarantee you it will be many of our own brothers and sisters in our own church. People can say this is a good thing, on and on and on. No. God prohibited this. We're not to do this. The Lord has given us clear counsel through spirit of prophecy and the Bible to say, no, this is not what any of us should be doing. We're not to communicate with the dead. And so, again, uh, go out, do your own research, take a look at this. But I thought I'd present this today. It's the first time I presented this. I just finished putting some of this together uh, just uh, yesterday, in fact. So um, there's a lot of new information out there. I suggest check it out. So why, on that note, why don't I have a closing prayer? Our loving Heavenly Father, oh dear Lord, how things have changed in this world and how quickly they've changed. And through the inspired words that you gave our sister White, the final movements will be rapid ones, and surely they are. We're, we're seeing things happen so fast, it would make our heads spin. But Lord, I just pray that nobody here and nobody that we know will ever fall prey to this. You made it clear to us that it is an abomination to you that if we try to communicate with the dead, whether it's through a medium, whether it's through a Ouija board, whatever it is, Lord, you have shown us that the dead know nothing, and we should leave it at that and go on and grieve our losses and move forward. And for those that want to, to obsess on this, as you said in your word, let the dead bury their own dead. But we need to go forward and carry the message that you have for us to give to so many who in this world, especially now, really need to hear because it's such a difficult place to live and it will get much more so over the years to come, however much time we even have left. So please, Lord, be with all of us as we go from here today. Let us not fall prey to this uh, deception. It's a big one, and it's uh, man's best effort to overcome the laws and the principles that you gave us in your word. Please be with us now as we go, and we just thank you. We praise you for all these things. And in Jesus' holy and precious name we pray and for his sake. Amen.